It's podcast time, everybody. Welcome, friends, family, boys and girls, ladies and gentlemen, mavens of motoring. This is episode two of the Motor1.com podcast, Rambling About Cars. I am your co-host, Christopher Smith. This week, we're talking a little bit about tech, but before we get into that, I want to thank you for listening, for giving us a second go. This is just the beginning of something awesome. Whether you're listening to us on YouTube, on Spotify, on Apple Podcasts, please click like, subscribe. You know the drill. This is a brand new show, so we want to make sure you get the new content every week. We're doing it every Friday. And yeah, this week, man, it's all about tech, tech and cars. Is it too much? Is it not enough? Um, I need to toss this over to Rambling About Cars co-host Chris Bruce. Chris, why don't you walk us a little bit through what we're going to talk about today? Absolutely. So, as you said, we're going to be talking about tech today. And to do that, we have MotorOne.com editor Jeff Perez, who I've known for years and who has been shopping for a car the entire time I've known (laughs) him. So, if anything, he's going to know about this stuff. Also, while Smith and I focus on the new side of things, Jeff drives a lot more than us. So he's going to have his own kind of unique perspective. Um, so we're talking tech, though, this week, uh, mostly because of the virtual CES show and two big things that have come out of there. We've seen Mercedes-Benz's uh, MBUX hyperscreen and the next generation of the BMW iDrive system. Um, so we're going to be talking about that. We're going to be, there'll be some hot takes. So get ready. Some. Um, <laughs> several. Um, <laughs> and then after that, we're going to have a little bit more fun. We're going to talk about Utes, as the Aussies call them. Um, we would probably call them, what, unibody pickup trucks, car-based pickup trucks. Um, and that's coming from, uh, we saw a, probably the best shot yet of the new Ford Maverick uh, this week. And we're gonna kind of discuss, is that a ute? Where does it fit in? And what's the future of that segment? Because we're gonna kind of see some stuff coming. Um, So yeah, uh, moving into things, Jeff, do you wanna introduce yourself? Is there anything you'd like to say? Um, And let us have it, Jeff, come on, man. Well, I mean, you said it pretty well. Like you guys, you guys are are the news guys. You're you're on it 24 seven, I'm out and about driving cars a lot. So I figured this is a good topic for me to jump in and, and give some voice to, especially since I have some strong opinions on uh, screens and buttons and just general ergonomics. Um, but yeah, that's about it. I'm excited to be here. Thank you guys for having me. Sure no, thing. Thank you. So thank you're familiar you. with the current MB UX system, and I'm going to throw a picture of that up. And can you kind of Tell us how it is right now. You kind of had some opinions on that, some thoughts on that. It debuted on the GLE class, um, or at least that's where you experienced it right. first. Tell me more. Yeah, so it, de- it debuted on the A class, um, which I think came out like a few months before the GLE. Um, this is the GLE you see here if you're watching mm-hmm. on YouTube. So the GLE is the first car I drove with MBUX. Um, and gosh, that was 20, is that 2018? 2019, I think, early 2019 at this point. That was like revolutionary, right? It, mm-hmm. it was one of the best systems, and it still is, right? Because it hasn't really changed that much. It was one of until the now. best until now, right? It was one of the best infotainment systems. Um, it just offered so much more than what you get on typical infotainment system. You have those two massive screens. You mm-hmm. have a bunch of options. You have augmented reality. You have Hey Mercedes voice control, where you can just, you know, say Hey Mercedes, change my you know, change the stereo to channel 36 or whatever. And, and it's just, it's awesome, right? There's and, so and does that work pretty well. The Hey Mercedes, does it, is it pretty good? It works on and off. Like okay. a lot of the times when we were driving uh, on that first drive specifically, actually, you know, what's funny, Brett Evans, our other senior editor uh, was driving with me before he worked for us. So we were on mm-hmm. that drive together. Um, but yeah, the Hey Mercedes is like hit and miss. If you say Mercedes at all, it'll typically kick on and, and say, <laughs> what do you need? <laughs> but, so hope you don't have a daughter or a dog named Mercedes. Yeah. 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 But otherwise it's good. I mean, it's just, it was the first, it felt like the first major shift in infotainment, like towards this future of screens everywhere and massive screens and mostly screen based interfaces. So it's, it's good, but it's, it's a, it's a dramatic step in the next direction, I think. 
And so speaking of screens, what we they've teased it a little bit beforehand, but what we finally saw was MBUX hyper screen. And it is it, it debuted at virtual CES and it is over 50 inches long. It's the entire width. It's of, hyper. It's hyper. Yeah. Hyper sounds so damn cool. It's just a name. <laughs> <laughs> um, it, it's over 50 inches, I believe, 56, 57, something like that. Uh, it's the entire width of the upcoming EQS EV. Um, and you're you're looking at it generally right here. And I'll have some more photos here in a second if you're watching it on video. And if not, we're hoping we explain it right. But, but it's, it, not, it's not one, we should be clear, it's not technically one gigantic touchscreen. It's one big class. But there are individual screens underneath. But when everything is turned off, it all just looks flush and minimalistic and cool, but we don't use cars when they're turned off, do we? We don't. And we're, I, I wanted to explain things a little bit first, and then we can kind of set it on fire because I don't like this thing, but I at least want to give it a fair shake and then I'll get the pitchfork out. Um, so, but it is three separate screens, but all in one enclosure, essentially. So you have a uh, instrument cluster, you have an infotainment screen in the center, and then you have a, the passenger kind of gets their own hybrid where they can do infotainment stuff, but then they can also do navigation stuff and music stuff. So it's, it's not quite either. Um, Jeff, what do you think of this? Well, uh, you took a breath hard. First. I, well, so it's hard because I'm I'm a young person, right? So I'm supposed to like screens, and that's like what the next generation loves. Millennials, they love their screens. They love you know everything about it. And even Mercedes was like, oh yeah, young people love screens, so we're gonna stick this giant screen in this car. And I think it's awful. Like aesthetically, it looks terrible. Like there's just it's one giant piece of glass that just has these crazy shapes to it. Um, and it has three screens. Like you said, it's not like one giant screen. So it, at least that sort of makes sense. Um, but it's just, it's so dumb. Like, what is the point of this? When you're driving, and this is my biggest like gripe with all of these screens, when you're driving, how do you know what you're doing? Like say you have your head, you're, you're, you're focused on the road. How are you supposed to know what you're doing if there's no buttons or knobs or anything? Like, it doesn't make sense to me. I don't know. I well, sound like an car, old person. The car is supposed to be driving itself at this point, right? I mean, right, yeah. are we supposed to be like level three, level four, like three or four years ago? I, I get the impression that this is a screen that's designed more for cars that have increased autonomy. Um, and, and those kind of systems available. I agree with you, Jeff, completely. And I'm definitely older than you. Um, and I, I hate to be the old guy, but it's just like that tactile sensation where you, you can, you can feel a button and you know what it does. You don't have to take your eyes off the, uh, off the road. In some cases, you don't even have to take your hands off the wheel. Oftentimes, the simplest solution is usually the best. Uh, I feel like Mercedes is really trying to complicate things in the name of aesthetics. And that's so the image that we have pulled up now, which is the uh, navigation portion of the screen and what they're calling level zero, that basically the, the uh, I guess, widgets, for lack of a better word, that's on top, those are also functional things. My issue is I feel like whoever designed this never drove a car in the winter and never drove a car like that's cold and where you want to wear gloves. And granted, this is a Mercedes-Benz EQS. This is going to be, we don't know, but it, it, it's going to be pricey. I, I think we can all agree on that. So maybe the owner of the, the EQS isn't going to experience this. But inevitably, this tech is going to trickle down and we, we actually have a little bit more on that later, but inevitably you're going to get this on lesser cars. And I, this thing would suck in the winter and it's winter right now. And I, I wear gloves when I'm driving in the winter cause it's chilly and none of my screens would work. Yeah. You know, that's, that's a good, I never thought about that, Bruce. I never thought about, cause I wear gloves a lot too, just because, you know, I don't, I don't want to grab the cold steering wheel. I mean, I've to had be cars, clear, you're in South Dakota. Dakota. I'm in Northern Ohio, not known as the, yeah. the warmest. But Jeff, though, is in Miami, so 
I don't wear any gloves. <laughs> Jeff does. <laughs> Jeff, you own a pair of gloves. Tell me truly. I do somewhere. I don't know where they are. They're hidden okay. in my closet, probably. Okay. Mine are in my coat pocket. They're always there. I know right where they are. Well, you just got to pay the extra like thirty bucks or whatever, and get the gloves with the little sensor thing in the fingers. Oh, it's a capacitive thing. Yeah. You know, but Mercedes is like going to sell some gloves that, that are for this screen. Oh, you know it. You know it. <laughs> Hundred fifty bucks. Yeah, of course. But it just feels like, you know. It, Granted, maybe in this segment, the argument I'm making, maybe it's a moot point, and I'll accept that. But I don't think this is the future because there are a lot of people in a lot of parts of the world, uh, largely northern parts of the world, that this is going to be kind of a tough sell. Yeah. So, again, not right now, but in the future, I don't know. I just don't love it. Like, it, it also kind of lacks... Um, it lacks personality. It's a very anodyne look. It's very antiseptic. Like it's pure. It's in a sense, it's got that Germanic thing going, but I, 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 maybe, you know, I'm only 35, but maybe I'm an old fogey, but I kind of liked analog gauges. They, they work pretty well. So you guys are know. making me feel really good right now. Cause I'm definitely <laughs> the old guy and Hey, I'm not alone. That's the thing, though. It's like, okay, yeah, young people want more touchscreens. Like you can see by the phones that are coming out, you can see by all the all the technology that that people are buying. They obviously want more screens. But I think what what some car companies like Mercedes, especially and BMW, which we'll talk about, you know, in a second, they're just misplacing what to do with it, right? Like there's got to be a better solution instead of just sticking screens on literally everything. I think heads up displays are are far beyond far behind where they should be. Like heads up displays should be more used than than they are now. Uh, steering wheel controls, I know a lot of companies do steering wheel controls well, but there's still not enough that do them like as primary functional things. You know what I mean? It's just mm -hmm. It's so weird to me. It feels like they're almost going backwards. Like Mercedes for a long time, they had the, the rotary dial. And I, was it MBUX before when it was the rotary dial? I don't remember. Or was it I mean, a lot command? Of was rotary dial. There have been a, kind of a lot of rotary dials out there. What was wrong with the rotary dial? I thought the rotary dial was great. I think the problem with with command was that the, that this, like the, the screen itself sucked like just the operating system sucked that the dial wasn't the problem they fixed the operating system but then they got rid of the dial for this touchpad which is like it's okay but it's not feels like it's a step backwards and then now they're just getting rid of it entirely and they're like look at all these screens touch them play with them while you're driving don't look at the road like i don't <laughs> understand well i mean it's like i said earlier this strikes me as a design for level three level four more advanced um autonomous cars yeah. And and they're plugging it in right now. I don't mind touchscreens by by any means. Um, I mean, you get them with the cool animations. Um, it's nice to have various functionality built into them where, hey, you can just go into this menu, check this, check this here. But within reason and still give me very basic, simple controls for the things that I'm using all the time, like radio, like climate control. It's a pain in the butt to have to cycle through a freaking touch screen just to do something as simple as change temperature so dumb. To, to adjust the volume on the radio. Um, and I know there are commands in place where yeah, just do voice command. Jeff, you said it yourself. How often do the voice commands work? Rarely. I mean, they, they, they don't always work. So now you're sitting here getting angry, yelling at the car. It's like you are your own road rager. You're road yeah. raging against your own car. You know what we this feels that. like? You know what this feels like, what Mercedes is doing? It's like when Apple comes out with a new phone. Like, mm -hmm. no, you don't need a headphone jack anymore. Like, no, we want that. They're like, That's still no, you don't need so it. Much. Mercedes is like, you don't need a volume button. We're like, no, we want that. Like, yeah, we do. No, you don't need it. Yeah, and, yeah. and it's... um. I mean, it's a classic case of not really listening to the customers. And and I saw somewhere where somebody was talking about um, this being just more of a nice. Was it you, Jeff, that was talking about, you know, from an engineering perspective, we just like the the cleanliness of it all. And it's like, yeah, so you're not driving it, though. Right. Mm -hmm. I have a quote here from from our friends at Roadshow. Shout out Daniel Golson, who did the interview. Um, he talked to Gordon, Gordon from Mercedes. 
And this is the exact quote. We were pushing for the elimination of hard keys because it makes it clean and modern. It's a completely different thing to operate. As designers, we love simplicity. You know what we as drivers don't love? Simplicity or oversimplicity. Because, yeah, because how hard does it be? You figure out where the keys are as you own a car right. over time. And and to Chris's point, like, and Volvo does this, Tesla does this. There's so many manufacturers, and it's not just Mercedes. I have so many issues with manufacturers and their touchscreens that it's like, I just, I live in Miami, so <laughs> it'll be like 100 degrees. I want to get in my car and just blast the AC, right? I just want to turn the knob and blast the AC. And then after five minutes or 10 minutes, I want to turn it back down and just cool it off. If I have to dig into a screen on the Volvo or the Subaru, whatever, that's so annoying to me. Like, just make a, a damn knob for something simple like that. And that's my rant. <laughs> I was so waiting for you to, to just, I was waiting for your head to just like turn into flames and it's just, just ah. it frustrates me. You, I don't know wrong. what automaker came up with it, but the three knob HVAC system works fantastic. One yeah. knob for fan speed, <laughs> one knob for temperature, one knob for where the air is going. I'm and totally I, sorry. I just had a flashback to uh, to Demolition Man. <laughs> the three the three, the three seashells. Yeah, he doesn't know how to use the three <laughs> seashells. Mercedes, they don't know how to use the three knobs. I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna call out another manufacturer here too because they deserve it. But Honda. I remember when the new, I mean, this was like two generations ago, I guess. When we drove the Accord, they got rid of the volume knob and they replaced it with this little scrolly thing on the steering wheel, which is like, it's like that meme. It's like, um, oh, we want you to do one thing and then they do it. It's like, no, not like that. Because we want steering, the steering wheel controls to be better, but mm -hmm. then they get rid of the volume knob entirely. But anyways, so I talked to the PR person and I said, you know, people want a volume knob, right? That they're gonna not like this car because of the because it doesn't have a volume knob. And he laughed at me. <laughs> and I go home, and my mom said, "Hey, how was the new Accord?" And she's had an Accord. She's had Accords her whole life, like five different Honda Accords. I said it was good, but it doesn't have a volume knob. And she did not buy the Accord specifically because it didn't have a volume knob. And that's not a that's not a made up story. That's not a joke. But yeah, it's crazy. And then they brought it back, but like. They don't There's, understand. It's one thing to be innovative and come up with a neat idea for the sake of the of it being an actual good idea. It's something different to just be clever for the sake of simply being clever. Right. Because you want to you want to advance it forward. You don't just want to show somebody, hey, look, I did something a little different just for the sake of being different. Well, that's fine. Was there a problem before? Well, yeah, a volume knob just looks unsightly. Design a better volume knob. Make yeah, it metal. Design a better volume yeah. knob. There are really nice volume knobs on 80s uh, stereo equipment that are metal and have like weight and heft to them. This is 30 years later. Just do that. Make a really nice volume knob. I get the feeling Let Bruce wants like a, a vintage, you know, like a 2020 car with like a vintage, I'm going to say 1984, like Craco <laughs> system. <laughs> Blau you know, punk, the, man. The, the, punk. The, the knobs, the chrome, oh, that'd be great. a little bit of wood trim, something I like a visual equalizer. I want to move all those little guys. Oh, oh, I forgot about those. The little, e yeah, the EQ. How'd you forget about the visual the equalizer? Individual. Like it's so fun. Well, <laughs> you could put you could put that on a display and then just have it touch sensitive. That's true. But now we're all oh, now we're back to, I want it physical. Now we're back to yeah. yeah. I just became I just became the bad guy. I'm sorry. Yeah. Just put it in a touch screen. I'm going to have another drink. Yeah. <laughs> so just very quickly, the other in new infotainment screen we saw from CES is the upgraded um, BMW iDrive system. And that's going to premiere in the iX. And naturally, like all of this tech, they don't make it for one car. It's going to filter down to everything else. Um, unfortunately, we have less to say about this because BMW had less to say about this. It's kind of still a teaser at this point. Um, it's not like MBUX hyperscreen where it's spanning everything. It's kind of a, an evolution of what we've seen before where there's clearly one screen for instruments, one screen for infotainment, and they're going to kind of mesh at some point. You know, you're going to have you're going to have navigation stuff on the instrument screen and vice versa. But um, 
just wanted to share that real quick. That was kind of the other big infotainment news. Um, in some places, or at least in Germany, it's going to be, it's going to have vehicle to vehicle communication with other BMWs. So they will know like, oh, there's a hazard ahead or something like that. And um, it might occasionally talk to a billboard. I know it's not supposed <laughs> to be happening, well, right? But come on, we know better. Yeah, it might talk. Yeah, it, yeah. Um, Check oh back man, can you one. imagine if like the tail lights on future BMWs, like they could tell a BMW was behind it, be like, "Your Use tires your are signal. low on, on uh, <laughs> PSI." Like, I wish you know what I hope the new iDrive does. It just like roasts you. Like sends you just roast over the over the screen because that's what they just seem to be doing now all the time. That'd be good. Yeah, but yeah, I like it. <laughs> we need to start uh, thinking out of the box with these systems. If we're gonna have all of these displays in cars, it's time to start putting them to some good use. Exactly. Yeah. Um, but uh, Mr. Smithy, we received a comment, a very nice comment. I actually oh, have to oh, say. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. We, uh, we received some some comments. Yeah, and just, just I, our, our first episode. So yeah, for our very you. first episode, and you wanted to read it, and you wanted to call out the person that said it because it was a very nice comment, and you know he had some criticisms, but he had some nice things to I'll, say. I'll, and I'll reach into I the can. Motor One rambling about cars mailbag. Oh, look at this! You remember this, these things <laughs> called paper? I, no. I I even printed this one up. No, no. <laughs> our, our first ep- all, all seriousness. Our first episode. Um, we were very happy to see some comments. We we're very happy to hear some responses. We thank you. We're starting to, we're just building this from the ground up yeah. and, and I already have that kind of involvement. We love it. And uh, yeah, we got a good email from a gentleman. I'm assuming gentleman named Blake who was just commenting about uh, what we were talking about the first episode where we were talking about just some of the things that, uh, that BMW was doing. Like I just mentioned, we also talked about our best and our worst vehicle debuts personally from 2020 and uh, and and Blake agreed with everything except my choice on the Wrangler 392 being the worst of 2020 and I suspect that Blake is not alone on that and I I totally I totally expected actually to get some more feedback um uh, Blake's response was that you know, how, how can you be negative on a company that's trying to actively one up the other guy? They've one upped Bronco with the Jeep with this amazing V8 powered, Hemi powered 392 uh, Wrangler Rubicon. And I guess my response to that is, I mean, it's a, it's a valid opinion. It's a valid opinion for sure. Jeep is trying to one up Bronco, but are they really one upping Bronco by creating a Jeep that'll get to 60 miles an hour in five seconds? I mean, to me, that's kind of like McLaren putting a suspension lift and big tires on a 720S and then well, saying, we just, we just one up Ferrari, buddy. But here's the, thing, no, here's the thing, though. <laughs> they did what they could when they could. They knew the Bronco was coming because we all knew the Bronco was coming and they debuted the concept. For that car, on the, on the Wrangler, day. on the same day the Bronco debuted, like but they you, knew what they were doing. Like, but but did they have to do something right away? Couldn't they just sit back and say, "Yep, yeah, okay, Bronco's coming out." You know, we've been here for what 50, 60 years doing this. Bronco wants to try to come back, but That's I feel okay. like I feel like you're missing the larger point, right? Like, you know why they did that? Because every time they put a Hellcat or a, a big V8 and the Charger Challenger, they sell a bajillion of them. So you know that people are going to want the same thing in a Wrangler, whether or not it is true to the Wrangler DNA or not. Uh, I don't um, I don't know that they're going to sell a lot of these. Well, at they're 70, sell everyone they make. At 75 grand, they might not. But I think there are still people that are going to want this thing. There are, there are a few that will want it. But here's the difference between Wrangler and Charger Challenger. Charger Challenger people, they're already in the mindset of, I want to do zero to 60 as quick as possible. So give me the biggest engine. Wrangler yeah. people do not care. That's true. Generally, yeah, and everybody, right. everybody wants power. Wrangler people do not care. And and a point that I guess I should have made last week that, that I'll make this week. You have two choices in a situation like this. A competitor comes out with a product aimed clearly directly at something that you offer, that you've offered exclusively for decades. You're going to feel a little very much competition. Exactly. So you have two choices there. You can react or you can respond. One of those 
is good. One of those, however, is a knee-jerk reaction that's usually bad. Now, I consider the 392 a reaction. They didn't think about what they were going to do and respond accordingly. They reacted to their competitor. That way can can be a little bit of a dicey road sometimes. And, hey, I love power as much as the next person. I just... I just see the 392 Rubicon not has trying to one up their competitor. If Jeep wants to one up their competitor, okay, let's get in, let's refine the Wrangler, let's actually get rid of the mirror issue where people take off their doors and now they don't have any side mirrors, right? Let's let's take a look at the at the death wobble that people have been talking about for a while. Has has good and for all the the good things that Wrangler offers, Jeep has been a little lazy with it over the years, I think, and. For good reason, they didn't really have any competition to speak up to. Now they well, do. You know, you know what we're going to have to do. We're going to have to carry the Wrangler 2 to Bronco eventually. Mm-hmm. And just oh, yeah. him up and that'll be a fun one. Oh, it, oh, oh it'll be a ton of fun. It, it'll yeah. be fun. I, you know, I, I'm really You and Britt and Clint are going to have a great time. <laughs> <laughs> I'm really hoping that by the time that comes around, there's a Bronco Warthog. Mm-hmm. Oh, I think there will be that, that you can that's buy amazing. that'll have as much, if not more, power that yeah. uh, that you can buy for probably a lot. Le- hopefully, a lot. I would less. say a lot. I, I would know. seventy-five. The seventy-five. Well, what's a what's a new Raptor go for? What's a new as F one fifty Raptor go for? I think you can start into one at about seventy. I think it's a little less than. I that. I think it's a little less than that. I don't know off the top of my head, but I think it's so, cheaper than that. So, so I mean, if 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 they're gonna price it accordingly or, or on a similar structure uh first edition broncos are going for what almost 60 but that's a fully loaded everything in the kitchen sink bronco if they do a bronco warthog version that doesn't have all the bells and whistles i'm sure you can option it up and get to 75 grand but if you can get oh, one get into one at yeah. 60 that yeah I, that's you know, number i had in my head and yeah. th- well, there's there's another thing jeep could have done bronco went and ran baja when's the last time you saw jeep do baja that's true, but it's also like I, I'm, I, I don't ascribe to the to the race on Sunday buy on Monday thing. I think that's so outdated. So maybe Baja's a little different, but yeah, could be. But Blake, thank you very much for the message. Yeah, Blake, we're glad we're glad you're enjoying the content. Buckle up, everybody, because oh my god, we're just getting started. Exactly, <laughs> and I want to reiterate: podcast at motor one dot com. If you're like Blake and you hear something that you agree with, that you disagree with, and you want to share your opinion, put it there. You can also comment on the YouTube video. Um, If you want to rate and review us on iTunes, um, I know we're on Spotify. I think we're on Stitcher. If it turns out there's some other service that you listen to and you're watching this somewhere and you want us on. Let us know. Yeah, podcast. and It might be pirated. What's that? <laughs> so if you're hearing, hearing this somewhere and we don't, yeah, if you're figuring, yeah I don't know where else you're hearing this. But we want sure. to get our cut of the pie here. Exactly. Oh, that reminds me. Somebody, there, there was a YouTube comment asking about, I think, what I had in the background if those were Power Rangers. Oh, I did see <laughs> that. Kind of, kind of, kind of like, <laughs> like right there. Power <laughs> Rangers are for nerds. Those are Gundams. Come on. <laughs> those aren't Transformers? But the Transformers are in the case. Oh. Okay. Fair enough. We'll we'll have a nerd episode later. Don't worry. We'll oh, get it'll there. come. It'll come. <laughs> we'll I, get there. I could move my camera right now, and things would get real nerdy. So, yeah. <laughs> well, let, let's, anyway. let's, let's 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 keep it in suspense. Let's exactly. let's talk about something that's near and dear to my heart, and, so, and I think it's it's for for you guys, right? I, uh, uh, I, I, I yeah. don't love it, but I respect it. But I know Jeff loves it. So yeah. Um. We're going to talk utes, or what's the American term for this? Car-based truck? Like, I think you know, these beams yeah. on this one. I mean, They're like I mean, subcompact what, pickups or something. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, when I was younger, we just called them El Caminos because, yeah, like, because that's, all yeah, there I mean, that's all there was left at that point. But, I mean, every car-based pickup truck or, you know, car-based truck, if you will, it was just called an El Camino, but yeah, they they've lived and they've right. thrived down in Australia. They are Utes, and oh, look at that! If if you're watching on YouTube, if you're not watching on YouTube, go follow us on YouTube because there you can see this beautiful what what year El Camino is at, Bruce? I believe that is a '68. '68 El Camino. Yeah, yeah. Wait, 
We're gonna have to do a whole episode on just like old school press photos because some of those are. Oh, so I would so be good. happy to. There are so many great ones. <laughs> They're all great. I want to know how the Cessna landed in a field of daisies. Yeah. Right. Well, I've, a I've, young I've, girl in pigtails is watching what I assume her parents are coming to their El Camino. <laughs> this is a bizarre image, but it's great. Because I mean, if seriously, has the airplane guy in the group? If there's a Cessna, Cessna just sitting in a field, you're not going to see people just kind of sitting around in suits. You're going to see fire trucks and probably ambulances. <laughs> well, if you look, it does look like, I'm sorry, this is a, uh, we're moving aside, but there does appear to be a runway or a road or something behind it. There's a definitely yeah. a stretch of tarmac. So yeah, but that airplane landed there, there and then like the guy just pushed <laughs> the rudder and I want to go into the field of wildflowers to meet I, my daughter. I like to imagine that there's a parking lot just off screen with people who park their cars in the parking lot and, you know, landed on the runway. They're like, what the hell are those people doing over there? Just in that field. Yeah. I've, I've flown Cessna 172s before. I don't think it would even power itself at full throttle through that field. (laughs) (laughs) It was, it was towed there. Who knows? Maybe it's just a cardboard cutout, but. Now we're getting a little off topic here. We're getting off topic. Let's I, get back I, to the I, youth slash Camino right. slash car based trucks. We we just we just got to talk at some point about all of these wacky, especially like from the late sixties, early seventies. I have no idea what was going on at that time that might promote some of these weird ass photos. I think Mad Men tells that story. I think alcohol and drugs. <laughs> <maybe. Yes. laughs> so Utes, where does why are we talking about Utes? So we saw. The best image to date, I, it's the best image we've seen, certainly, of the Ford Maverick. And the Ford Maverick rides on the same platform as the Escape, the Bronco Sport. And actually, in Europe right now, it's the same as the Focus. So in its own way, it's a Ute, maybe? I mean, this. I mean, this has is raising the question. I mean, everybody's been saying, well, it's a it's a small truck to replace what the Ranger used to be in Ford's lineup. A right, but now it's below the Ranger in the modern lineup. Which, yeah, I mean, it's below the Ranger, but the Ranger has grown. Technically, right. you could you could still say, you know, this is the compact truck, but with the architecture not necessarily being rear wheel drive right. specific. Yeah. You know, That's now true. we're back to asking the question: Okay, is it a Ute? Is it a small truck? I mean, I guess technically with four doors, you'd say it's a small truck because the Utes have traditionally just been two door, um, you know, vastly for either, the most part, especially I, either, in the country. Yeah. Right. Either a bench seat with three people or, you know, two buckets. But I mean, it, it, it raises the question. It's a ridge line. Uh, yeah. <laughs> the ridge line right? kind of kept this, the ridge line and the Subaru Baja both kind of kept this flame burning. Like everyone left and those two kind of kept it going. And then the Ridgeline even got its own second generation after a while that they kept the torch burning for the unibody truck. The Ridgeline is, I don't know if it's the most underrated car on sale right now, but it's, it's top five. Like that is such a good vehicle and people just dismiss it immediately because it's unibody because it's just a pilot, you know, with a bed. But when I tell people that want a small truck, I mean, they never take the suggestion when I say a Ridgeline because they want a quote unquote truck, Um, but it's such a good vehicle. And and it's kind of surprising almost that Ford is just now, and I guess we'll talk about Hyundai, they're just now getting around to like a very small unibody truck that you can drive every day, be super comfortable in, and then maybe take off road when you want to. Like it's, it's such a great idea. I don't know why more companies haven't done it. I mean, well, if the I, Bronco Sport is any example, which our colleague um, Brandon drove, it was pretty capable off-road. So given that this is the same platform, there's nothing stopping them from making an off-road version. I, you know, I don't think that's going to arrive immediately, but the, the and, it could happen, certainly. And, and how many people, I mean, how many truck buyers are taking their vehicles off-road in a manner where... It's right. they really need some superhuman capability to go off road. The vast, vast majority of drivers, pickup or otherwise, are not going to find themselves in those kinds of circumstances. I'm I'm going to say something that might be controversial, but Tesla's kind of right. Like the Cybertruck makes sense for as ugly and as dumb as it is. 
that is a lifestyle truck in the same way that this and the Santa Cruz will be lifestyle trucks and that the Ridgeline is a lifestyle truck. Like if you want to off-road, you're going to get an off-road. You're going to get a Wrangler. You're going to get a, a, you know, a regular Bronco. If you just want something that's capable and can haul things and you think might, you might take it to the bike trail or something every week, every few weekends, then why would you not buy one of these, you know? And you're, and you're right, Jeff, just the driving quality. I mean, I've owned a couple of pickup trucks. Um, I, I did have the opportunity to drive a Ridgeline a long time ago. I've never really appreciated how a, a pickup truck drives, even the newer ones. They just have too much of a rough ride to, to really satisfy me. Um, for something to drive every day, if yeah. I'm if I'm if I'm doing if I'm going crazy off road exploring, yeah, that's different. But yeah, the the vast majority of truck buyers would probably love a Ridge Line. It would do everything that they needed to do. It would be far more comfortable. But the again, there's that image is uh, it's a unibody. It, it's not a real truck, and I, I I would have to agree. Is there a segment there that? Other automakers have been missing. Are they now stepping into that now with uh, with Ford with the Maverick and uh, this vehicle that we're looking at right now on YouTube, Bruce? Right. So what we're looking at now is a rendering, and I need to be clear: we don't exactly know what it's going to look like. But Hyundai is going to bring out the Santa Cruz, which is the same general idea as the Maverick. It is a pickup truck, but it is on a unibody chassis. It's not body on frame like your F-150, Ram, Silverado, et cetera, are. Um, and the thing is, they've been teasing and developing this thing for ages, but we know that they're pretty serious about it. We know that it's coming. And because it's been in development so long, it's probably going to be the first one to fight the Maverick. Now, it's going to be interesting in a lot of parts of the country that the Ford versus the Hyundai, like, it, I, I don't know. Um, but at least Hyundai is going to have a competitor. And I suspect we are going to see competitors from other makes. We know... Um, we know FCA has the Ram 700 in Mexico that I guess I don't know the engineering of it, but it would seem applicable if they see success that they could adapt that vehicle for the United States market. There are other vehicles of this genre out there that, you know, basically, in my opinion, Ford is gets to test the waters. If the Maverick turns out to be a success, you're going to see this segment explode like it hasn't in decades. Well, the only problem I see with Ford that I don't see with Hyundai or other manufacturers that might do the same thing, like Honda, for example, is that Ford already has two good trucks in the Ranger and the F-150. Sure. And we know that when the Ranger came out, when the current generation Ranger came out uh, a few years ago, they had trouble selling those initially because what was happening was people would go to the dealership. They say, I want a Ranger. They go look at the Ranger and they realize I can just pay a little bit more for an F-150 and I'll just get an F-150, right? It's, it's not that much of a jump compared to the Ranger. So, I, I mean, right now they, I, I believe the Ranger is selling much better now. Um, but that was sort of like, why would you not upsell them to an F-150? And for the Maverick, it's sort of like, okay, why would you not sell the, upsell them to a Ranger or an F-150? That's the only problem I see with Ford. Hyundai, I think, is perfectly positioned to do super well in this segment because they don't have anything else like this. They have the Tucson SUV and they have the Palisade and all their other SUVs that are all great. So if they just put a bet on that, essentially, I think it'll be, it'll be a huge hit for them. Well, you know, it, if Ford was smart... Um, they they wouldn't approach selling the Maverick the same way they've done for Ranger and F one fifty because it it is going to be something different. If so, mm -hmm. I don't see somebody going in to look at a Maverick thinking that well, if I can just pay a little bit more, I'll just get the Ranger. I I feel like that should be different demographic. I don't know. I don't know. Maybe I'm maybe I'm wrong on that. But you're you're right, Jeff. In that if especially if the prices are pretty close together people are going to ask well why would i want to go with the smaller maverick when i can go with a little bit bigger ranger yeah but ford, ford needs to ford needs to do their diligence on that and find the market that's going to buy that maverick Which and, i think 
I think they will, right? Because because they've done such a good job on marketing Bronco and Bronco Sport individually, and I think they they know that certain buyers are going to come for Bronco Sport and certain buyers are going to come for the Bronco. So to your point, yeah, I think they're gonna they're gonna definitely do a good job of that. Also, we might have kind of seen something about that today where Ford is pulling out of manufacturing or pulling out of more of manufacturing in Brazil, whereas from everything that we've heard, the Maverick is going to be built in Mexico and exported both to the United States and to the South American market. So, Ford is, yes, they are working on uh, on streamlining their operations, I guess. Right. Um, They're not that- putting all of their eggs in one basket. So if the Maverick doesn't turn out to be a success in the United States, they still have the massive South American market that already has a history of car-based pickup trucks from Ford. And they do have an eye on global platforms much more now so than they have in the past. So, I, I mean, I guess there is a bit of a safety net there if it doesn't do good in the United States. Hopefully... It does. I'm a well, fan. Sure. I've, I've never been a huge pickup person. Um, I've owned an F-250 diesel, which is like the most anti Christopher Smith vehicle ever. Um, and I, I, I kind of loved it. I don't know why. I kind of loved it. It was an 89 F-250 diesel. It was it, it kept breaking down, but I don't know. It was cool. And I had a Dodge Ram uh, before Dodge and Ram separated. I just don't really have much interest in going back to anything like that, but I would have an interest in something like the Maverick, especially if it has more of a car, of a car like ride, a car like feel. Um, I just don't like getting thrashed around on just like little tiny potholes. I've got a Mustang for that. And the Mustang is a lot more fun to drive. So I I have to ask you, how excited would you feel about something like this? Which uh, for our, uh, our listeners is the um, <laughs> the Holden Malu uh, that is currently for sale, and uh, as of right now, it, it's it, it's selling for five hundred and fifty seven thousand dollars. I need to scroll through our story here, and I apologize whether that is Australian dollars or American dollars, but regardless, it's a good amount of money for a very sporty Ute. And well, you know what my question is? Because since we're talking about the Maverick and the Santa Cruz, at what point, like, those are so small. They're going to be so small compared to the Ranger. At what mm-hmm. point do we just say, like, all right, let's just build these, like, screw trucks. Like, let's stop trying to shrink trucks, and let's just put a bed on a car. And this is the result. Yeah. And I yeah. love this. Like, this car, I think I wrote a story a few years ago. It was, I think it might have been a Christmas story. Like, what car do we want to see under our Christmas tree? You know, no price, no rules, no regulations. This was that car. Any car, if I could buy any car, this would absolutely be it. Supercharged V8. It's essentially a Corvette with a bed, right? Yeah. That's so cool. Or a Camaro yeah. with a bed, actually. Yeah. I think it's yeah. the same platform as the Camaro. Yeah. yeah. And, and how much, and how much, I haven't been following this story too close. How much is that going for right now? I mean, obviously, <sighs> Holden, I mean, Holden is is gone in Australia, sadly. Right. Yeah. Um, so, so cars like this, I mean, I mean you won't see so these gotta, coming around again. I got to do a little math here. I, the live bid right now is 735000 Australian dollars, but um, I need to actually look up and see what that is, USD. Um General Motors, if you're listening to this, that is five hundred sixty-five thousand four hundred sixty-two dollars and ninety-one cents. There are and, still people that want these cars, and look at what they're willing to pay. Um, and there's still eighteen days on this auction, and it's already yeah. at that. So, I mean, that's a ton of money. Oh. There's a yeah. company, um, and I don't know if they're still around in Colorado, called Left Hand Utes. I think you guys might have heard of them. I have, yeah. They essentially what they do is they buy um, Maloos and other Utes from Australia that are damaged. They bring them to the U.S. They repair them. They convert them to left hand drive so they go in the U.S. and then they resell them. You know, and they make, obviously they make a good profit off of it. I called the owner of that shop, and I mean, he he was sound, he was a very nice guy. Like he walked through the whole process of what they do. We talked for almost an hour, but he. Him and I are like were like kindred spirits and almost felt like because he was a maniac. Like only a crazy person would do this. Only someone who was obsessed with these cars would go through the trouble of buying them damaged, 
importing them, converting them, trying to resell them. And, but he loved it. Like he clearly loved what he did. And I was like convinced, I was like, this is the best car. Like I want to buy one of these. I want to be this crazy person one day and have a bunch of these in my garage. Like they're so cool. I think to be clear, this is this one specifically is out of the norm. This is a very rare example of a yeah. very rare example. I, I I don't know how many of these were made, but this is not what your new your normal Malu Ute uh, will sell for. But yeah, I it's think fascinating they like- that this one is just going for such an insane amount of money in Australia. I don't even know the exact amount, but they had to have built like just over a hundred of these ones or something, with like crazy supercharged v8 you know just stupid amounts of horsepower i want to say over 700 horsepower or something so close it's got to the that. zr1 engine which is rated okay. at 635. okay and, yeah and not so much weight over the back axle or zero <laughs> weight over the back <laughs> axle basically. well you could you could put some cinder blocks in there that'll help yeah i mean you could drive that stupid thing to home depot load it up with uh, mulch and just you know take it on home well, it's I mean, the the, car. It, it really is. It, it would be a great vehicle for a lot of people. I, I, I mean, I don't do a lot of shopping where I have to carry big things, but I do more than I realize probably. And I would love to have a vehicle like that, that can give me a little bit of that practicality. My Mazda six, I, I, one of the reasons I love that car so much is, is because I mean, first gen six with a hatch five door hatch. I can carry a washing machine in that car and it's still, it still feels and drives like a good fun car. If I yeah. could have something like that, I mean, I would take that every day over the week. Hey, that's the one thing because journalists love the, you know, the wagon, right? Everyone's like, Oh, I want a wagon. Why yeah, so it's like just, a prerequisite, right? Yeah. Right. Why don't you just do an inverted wagon essentially, right? Is the Malou just do a pickup truck car. So, so, yeah. so it, you know, it's funny that you mentioned that because somebody in this group of three once had a 1994 Buick Roadmaster estate <laughs> that he he toyed with because, I mean, it wasn't in bad shape, but it wasn't in great shape. And he toyed with the idea of just yanking out the back seat and then taking the Sawzall to that partition between the, the back seat. Or, or, or no, 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 I was, I'm sorry. It wasn't the wagon. I also had a Roadmaster sedan. Oh. I had to. It was the sedan that I was gonna. I was gonna take the back seat out, cut out that partition, and basically make it, you know, just a bench seats up front, cargo completely in the back. That there you go. Great. It's I, a good I'm, idea. I'm, I'm, a little, I'm a little crazy. I'm a little crazy, but you know, to, to kind of jump back to what we were going on earlier, um. U.S. automakers are stepping away from sedans and hatchbacks, and they want everybody to buy SUVs and trucks. And yes, they make far more money. They, I mean, they, they, make, they make far more money, and, and people seem to – I mean, there's buyers for them. I mean, there's also that, certainly. Yeah. There's, 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 oh. there's, no, there's no argument there. But is there a spot for something like the Maverick where it's, it's the ute for the U.S.? And mm-hmm. not not necessarily in a four door format, but maybe this is how sedans and even smaller hatchbacks live on. Something mm-hmm. you know, like you know, like like a a, a return of a Subaru Brat or something, right? Mm-hmm. I, we Brat. talked about this before. Uh-huh. The pod. Yeah, yeah, we talked about this before. But if Subaru decided to make a unibody truck like this and slap a Baja or a Brat badge on it, they'd sell eight billion of them. Like. So I many think, Subaru people would love that. Mm-hmm. I um, think, and and maybe this is how maybe this is how cars live on with U.S. automakers. I, I mean, we've seen uh, we've seen spy shots of the the Ford Fusion, what were they calling it, the the Fusion Cross or whatever, where it basically, yeah. I mean, from what it looks like in the spy shots, it's it's the Ford Fusion that Ford got rid of, just a little bit higher, and it kind of looks like a wagon to me. Mm-hmm. But mm-hmm. I mean, maybe this is another way these vehicles live on, and. Yeah. I mean, I mean, I would love it. I think there are a lot of buyers out there. When Pontiac brought the the uh, the the Holden over, has the G8, and this was back what two thousand must have been two thousand six, two thousand seven, when they had their their G8 concept. I think we got a picture of yeah. I I was ready to go out and buy one of those. 
just because that looked, I mean, that thing just looks mean. It looks aggressive. It has capability yeah. to haul actual stuff in the back. Um, and fun fact, one of the very first uh, articles I ever wrote has an automotive journalist. I don't know if you call me a journalist at that point. I was still doing marketing stuff and I was just, I wanted to write a little bit on the side. That was one of the first vehicles I wrote about. Really? I can't even huh. remember. It was like car, car tr- troposphere or some weird place that I'm sure no longer <laughs> exists, but it was just, it was, I wanted to do some writing on the side. I was doing marketing work at the time. And yeah, that was one of the first vehicles I wrote about. And I remember writing that, Hey, Pontiac's making this happen because back then they said, we're making this happen. Yeah. And then Pontiac kind of died. Died. Yeah. Well, so it's, also, and I apologize for interrupting, but also, as Jeff said, we do talk about these things before the podcast starts, yeah. before we start recording. And so there are two other real quick images I want to share, and they show Ford's history with these types of vehicles. So I'm going to start with the very beginning, and I'm going to end with what is very, very close to the end. So I want you to guys, you guys to react to these two vehicles. So we have the beginning here, and this is, I believe, I don't have all the information. I believe this is either a 58 or a 59 for Branchero. Yeah, that's, it's late 50s right there. Yeah. And, and for the folks that can't see it, again, search up Motor One on YouTube, our, our MotorOne.com uh, YouTube page. You can see this wonderful image once again. Automakers, what were they thinking? I guess um, in the nineteen, in the late nineteen fifties, everybody thought that people in the eighteen fifties dressed like like clown. <laughs> what I mean, do you mean? The, the, what do you mean? Uh, what were they thinking? That's awesome. I want to dress like that and drive a, a pickup truck like that. That's great. <laughs> it's it's like the old west in Technicolor. But the point is, is that this idea of taking your everyday family car or maybe today your everyday family crossover and chopping it up and putting a pickup bed on the back, this is not a new idea. This has been happening oh, no. for ages. Oh, yeah. mm-hmm. And it, it, it's kind of cool. It, it's kind of cool in it. this way, not only because the image is so absurd, but because the car is so absurd. It's got fins at the back, but it's a pickup truck and it's a car. Like, and everybody's wearing a cowboy hat. And everybody is wearing a cowboy hat. Sorry, and they YouTube, look like my light they is they just did like a, a Western show at the circus. That just, yeah, that, that, that kind of cracks me up. Yeah. And then the other end of the spectrum is where it looks really cool. Um, I, I, again, I'm very, very sorry. I don't have a year on this. That's a, it, that's a mid 2000s uh, okay. Ford Falcon. Ute Thank you. From, from, from Australia. Yes, it is from Australia. And I mean, that's, uh, that's a really good looking car. I, I know Jeff, you, you like the Holdens. Um, I like it a little we're better. Probably, we're probably destined for Thunderdome at some point because <laughs> I, I, I really like the Falcon. And I mean, if you think the Mustang versus Camaro wars in the U.S. are bad, you need to you need to check in on the Holden versus Ford wars in Australia. They're they're I mean, it's bloodthirsty and it's oh, awesome yeah. in every way. And uh, and yeah, I mean, that car just looks incredibly sleek. Of course. Um, Ford dropped the Falcon in the United States. So I'm trying to remember the last year of the late Falcon in the United 60? States. It, it was it was the late 60s, but it kept going in Australia, right. and and a lot of people don't realize that uh, the original Mad Max car, you know, the black Interceptor V8, um, that's a Ford Falcon from mm-hmm. Australia, yep. and they the Ford Falcon line continued all the way until very recently when yeah until they left when, the market when, and now like Holden Holden. left the market. There's kind yep. of no domestic manufacturing of th- those brands in Australia anymore, which is sort of a shame because there's such a long yeah. history of it. So Ford GM, it's time for you to step up in America. Let's let's make these here, and we can save the world. <laughs> exactly. We I'm not sure last of the V8 we can, save, we can save the world with these car-based pickup vehicles with beds, with big engines. You can even make them electric. That's cool. That's fine. Electric oh, yeah. power is, hey, instant torque will take it. 
but oh, man. not every solution needs to be a pickup truck or an SUV. <laughs> and, and I think now is, is the time to bring these back. Yep. That just, that just got me thinking if Ford doesn't build a Maverick Raptor, they're dead to me. Uh, <laughs> no <point. laughs> can, you re- can you really call something that small? Well, I technically Raptors traditionally were small. What about right. a Mach E pickup truck? Oh, a what? Mm. A Mach E pickup truck? A Mach E? Yeah. A I'd Ford like Mustang Mach E pickup truck. Yeah, that would work. You guys are doing this like <laughs> idea, like GMC isn't doing the same thing with the Hummer. Like, it's the same well, that's, a, that's a whole other podcast episode. Yeah, I think I think we should save that for another podcast episode. Yeah. Well. Um, Jeff, I thank you for joining us this time. Do you have any social media? Any, do you have anything you need to promote? Uh, I mean, read my stuff on Motor One, and you can follow me at Not a Boat Captain on Twitter and Instagram. That's where I post most of my stuff. Very good. Yeah. Um, I want to thank everybody for listening. And so, guys, I've had this idea for a game I want to play, and you can tell me if it's a stupid idea. But I think for every episode, we should try to see how many cars we can link to that episode number. So we are on the rambling about cars episode two. So how many twos can you think about with cars? And Smith, I will start with you. Don't start with me. Okay, I will start (laughs) and then I will keep it going. So let me finish my drink and then I'll come up with something. Deal. So I will say the Chevy two, which inevitably inevitably became the Nova. That's way before my time. I have no idea what that is. It's before my time too. <laughs> it's before, well, it's before my time too. I'm not that old guys. Come on. All right. Should I pick one? Yeah. Um, I got a two. I'm, I'm going to go with the BMW two series just okay. because I've been looking at it is a two. I've been looking at used M2s online, and I'm hoping they get cheaper because they're too expensive still. What are they going for these days? A good one is is still over forty. I've seen some it's at not like as bad as I thought because like thirty eight. One M's are still like fifty something, right? Yeah, but those were more rare. I think right. they only built a limited amount, and those are supposedly better. I've never driven one, but they're supposedly really good. The M2 you can get a base non competition for like. 38 used. You can find like a high mileage one, which is not bad. bad. So yeah. Smith, do you have an automotive two? <clears throat> no, it's my turn. Huh? Okay. Citroen two CV. Yeah. Perfect. It's quirky. It's simple. Um, Snoopy drove one in. Um, <laughs> Oh, what was what was that Charlie Brown movie? I'm a huge. Oh, Charlie you're Brown losing fan. me now. Like, I'm a huge Charlie. Unless Brown it's fan. the, Chris, the Charlie it's, Brown Christmas special. No, it's, it's the one. It's the one where he, he had some pen pal or something in France, and they all drove to France, and they rented a two CV that Snoopy was driving and was flipping people off on the Wait, highway. So I mean, Snoopy was <laughs> b- both drove a two CV and was the Red Baron at the. St- He's freaking Snoopy. He can do anything, man. Yeah, I mean, Charles Schultz was a really good cartoonist, so I can't fight that. Um, so I, I'd love that. I love that car. Ever since Snoopy drove it, so yeah. two CV number two, Polestar two. Are there any other automotive twos that we're missing? I'm sure. I'm sure there are. Oh, I'm sure. But I'm just saying, but, off the top of any of our heads, anyone got an automotive two? Two. Two. And, I, and, and before anyone comments, wait, I want wait, to make wait, it clear. Wait. Maybe one day we get to episode 205, 206, and so Peugeot 205, 206 makes the count. Oh, so it literally okay. has to be a two. All star two. So, so I couldn't say F250, which – No, you couldn't say F250. I, I That's episode 250. Okay. Okay. And I just said Polestar 2. Oh, you did. That's right. Yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll save that for episode 250. <laughs> yeah. I think that's it. Yeah. Well – I, I thank everybody for listening. Um, like I said before, you can watch us on YouTube for sure. You can listen to us on Spotify and Apple I, or Apple Podcasts. I still say iTunes. I'm sorry. Um, and I believe we're on Stitcher. And if there's some service that you listen to podcasts on that you have somehow heard this podcast and want us to be on, 
let me know. Uh, send an email to podcast at motorone.com and we'll figure it out. Um, so yeah. So thank you, Jeff, for being on tonight. Thank you, Mr. Smith, for being on tonight. And thank you for listening to a second episode of Rambling About Cars. We thank you a lot. Um, have a good evening. Have a good morning. Have a good afternoon whenever you're listening to this. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye.